Hey everybody, how y'all doing? All right, thanks for bearing with us. Um, so I'm here to tell y'all a story. It's called the Engineer with a Soul. Uh, it draws from a book I wrote called Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime. Uh, but first, I'm gonna give you an idea of you know, who I am, really. Um, I was born in Beijing in the late 70s, uh, actually on the seventh floor of an apartment building in the middle of the city, right there. And I grew up with my grandparents. Uh, well, my parents had to work in a different part of the country. Now, in the last you know, 30, 40 years, Beijing has become a lot more congested and polluted, but it's still my hometown. And so I still feel like it has its moments. Now, the very first thing I remember engineering or designing was actually uh, fashioning bricks out of mud that I found downstairs uh, and uh, pretending that I was making gold, all right? Because their form pleased me. I would carefully wrap up, you know, mud bars in uh, newspapers and I'd leave them under the bed to dry in kind of a blunt alchemistic attempt to, uh, you know, literally make money. And uh, I would then try to pawn off this gold bar on my friends uh, for candy. This did not work. Uh, but it was fun. And yes, I was a strange kid. But I think, in a way, all kids are strange. Uh, they do things that make no sense to their future adult selves. But I think that's also what's really awesome about childhood uh, and what makes it so uninhibited. You know, kids are beholden to nobody. So they're like much more free to be themselves. And I think as we all grow up, we struggle to really hold on to that playful part of us. Uh, in my childhood, you know, it was really filled with comic books, toys, video games. I played a lot of these. I would stand, actually, I didn't have a lot of money, so I would stand uh, in the arcade watching other people play video games for hours, and I loved it. And I still play video games, you know. Uh, I think I was just playing StarCraft earlier this week. And so these comic books, toys, video games would really inform how I think about design later on. I moved to the United States to live with my parents and uh, when I was nine, and the age got me a, a guitar. This completely changed the trajectory of my life because, uh, well, I, it made me realize how much I not only loved music, but the making of it. Uh, and then, you know, I went to middle school and high school in Kansas. This is 20 years ago. And I have to say, I feel like life in high school was much simpler back then. Because I feel like we didn't have as much to worry about in terms of, like, things to prepare for as the next step. We could just do what's in the present. And we did a lot of, a lot of playing. Backyard football, music, video games, and, uh, yeah, and there was something nice about that. I went to college in 1996 studying computer science before, you know, it was like a thing. And I did this because it was fun. Because uh, I really like building things, you know, like the mud bricks. I like building things. And I took a lot of music classes at the same time and a lot of great friends. Now, the thing about you know, education of any sort is that you think you're learning one thing, like computer science, but really you're always absorbing things about the rest of life. You know, I learned when I was taking computer science classes that not all answers lie in algorithms or in systems, right? And also that things like, I don't know, it depends often really great answers. And I became okay with that. And knowing that sometimes that may be the right answer or in, in the meantime. And I took what I learned in undergrad to grad school to study computer science, but specializing in computer music. And uh, in, high in, in grad school, that's when I started making a thing called Chuck, and that's, I'm going to give you a demo. Now, Chuck is a programming language with which you can you know, write code to generate sound. And uh, this is what it looks like. I have a little program here that I've prepared. In this program, I'm going to describe, we have a sine wave generator. It sounds like that. Make that a little louder. Now here it's going to be an array of pitch classes. 
we go into an infinite loop in here, we're going to randomly choose the pitch and then randomize it into, a different, a di into an octave. Then we're going to wait a bit until we do that all over again. So if we're to do this, we just hear kind of this one note. But let me randomize the octave. Same pitch class, and different octaves. Now let's go ahead and add a second, a major third, perfect fifth, and let's go a little faster here. Well, now we've got some computer music going on here, and uh, let's add a bit of reverb. Ah, now it sounds a bit more cavernous. Let's add a sixth. Make it faster still. Add a seventh. And drop the sixth. So, this is how you would typically use Chuck. You just write code and very immediately you can see the effect it has on the sound you're generating and it's kind of a very much in the moment kind of way to work. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of stuff I've been working on and that brings us back more or less to the present and uh, I became a professor at Stanford University in 2007 and working on computer music and design. And, and around the same time, I co-founded a company by the name of Smule uh, to really kind of embody some of the things that I've been researching and making it into products, you know, kind of that go out into the world. And I've continued to design since, right? And this is the thing that I do, I design. But the thing is, we all design. You know, my notion of design is that it's an act of alignment. We design when we bring any part of the world into alignment with what we consider to be useful, on one hand, or also with what we consider to be beautiful, or good, or truthful, right? We design quite simply to bring the world into a closer kind of alignment with our notion of the way things ought to be. In this broad sense, all of us design. This leads me to the next question, what does it mean to design well? Well, it's a matter of craft, it's something you just do and get better at. And I'm going to give you a story uh, of Ocarina. It's a story of design, it's something I designed 10 years ago. It's, uh, it's kind of like a flute-like instrument for your phone. And let me give you a quick demo. So this is my phone, and I'm blowing to the microphone to make sound. I'm using multi-touch control pitch, and uh, accelerometer is mapped to, uh, to vibrato. And you can play little ditties with this thing. So this is a, well thank you. And this is Ocarina in gameplay mode. The quadruplet of circles is telling you how to play the next note, but how you express that note is up to you. Now, the design of Ocarina was not complicated, and in a way, you know, this is design proceeding backwards. Uh, I would say backwards, I mean backwards from the end user, and from the experience you would want that user to have when they actually use the thing you've made. For Ocarina, I wanted the player to feel, you know, a sense of magic, to forget that they're using, like, an everyday technology. Um, and I want them to use it, to do this in a way that depends on the technology, but hopefully they forget the technology. You know, it's really about the music you're making and not really what you're making it on in this case. And, uh, and finally, I wanted this to not feel like it's an app that's emulating an instrument. I wanted your phone to feel like the instrument itself. So those were kind of the ways I thought about, you know, how I want this thing to really feel. And, 
And this is to say there's more than meets the eye in design. You know, the way that anything is designed, a tool, an instrument, a toy, a video game, changes the way you think about using that thing. And in turn, how you go about performing tasks with it. Uh, the media theorist Marshall McLuhan is known for expressing that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. You know, the things we build at the end of the day come back to change the way we think, feel, and act. Um, now, I should tell you there's another dimension, Ocarina, and it's a social dimension that allows you to listen to people blown to their phones around the world. This isn't the same app. This is uh, some person playing O Shenandoah from the East Coast. Who are these people? I don't know. Like, the app was not designed to, uh, to tell you that, but really to get you to ask these questions in the first place. Like, who is that out there playing Legend of Zelda from Indonesia, right? The app is here to make you wonder. Um, and again, this is something that would not be possible without technology, but hopefully the user never notices the technology. And this is design a social experience. And if there's an underlying tacit philosophy to kind of the design of the social aspects of Ocarina, it might be this, is that technology should create calm. Now, this is uh, an utterance by Mark Weiser, who is the CTO of, uh, of Xerox Park, just up the road from here. And, and it's quite a remarkable statement. It's, this is not some comment about technology being useful or solving our problems, but it's a sentiment that technology, whatever its function, could bring us a kind of calm, an inner peace. Uh, and it's in a, a vision of how we might want to live with the technologies that we actually have in our world. Now, combine this thought with how we use mobile phones today, where screens are everywhere. They are pervasive, but they're anything but calming. Now, this is a review left on iTunes for Ocarina in 2009 from a US soldier deployed in Iraq. This is my peace on Earth. I am currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights I may have off, I am deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that lets you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It is the exact opposite of my life. Right? And I can tell you that as a designer, it feels great when someone uses your product. But there's no better feeling when you realize that something you made has you know, brought like a moment of calm, something human, to, to another person. And this is to say that while good design enables us, great design, I think, seeks to understand us, something about us, make us feel understood. You know, Ocarina wasn't going to pluck that soldier from the middle of the war they were in, but maybe it momentarily transcended it for that person. And this is all to say design then isn't just about practical needs, uh, as we might be often learn as engineers and designers, but that it can also embody the values that we have, the deep beliefs that we have, and that things that matter to us. You know, Ocarina wasn't designed from like a survey of like, hey guys, we're building an app, what should we build? And people were like, oh, well, how about like a flute I can blow into my phone to play, and I want a, a globe I can listen to other people blow into their phones from around the world. No, that's not how it was designed. You know, I'd say Ocarina is designed from a simple belief that music making does a person good. And that this technology could be a goodly democratizing medium to actually get people to play more music, right? It's kind of a value-based design that, that resulted in the Ocarina being the way it was. That design then can have this kind of power, good or bad, over our emotions, our thoughts and our actions implies that there has to be an ethical dimension to the way we build things as designers and engineers. You know, it's not a matter of what we can do with technology, but also what we ought to do. And that is a matter of ethics. Now, on one hand, we might think of ethics as like, well, how do we build technology that like does no evil? You know, which admittedly is kind of a pretty low bar. Or maybe this is a better question. Should we ethically speaking to do good with the things we build with technology? You know, maybe that's a better question, but sometimes I like to frame the question as how do we want to live with our technologies? And here I think we have a different way of looking at 
at design and the ethical, not responsibility so much, but kind of the aspirations of kind of how the things we do, how the things we make, how do they better us as human beings, right? And in a way, design is all about this duality. On one hand, we design things to, as a means to achieve some purpose, some end. You know, Ocarina was a means to make, make music by blowing to your phone. Yeah, it's also a gag toy. The gag being that it actually works. Um, on the other hand, the things we design have meaning beyond their sheer functionality. There are aspects to Ocarina that, that are not useful beyond itself, but perhaps are interesting. So we set up this duality between means, that's the things that we need to get to the next part of our life, and the ends are the things that make life rich and interesting. And so design is trying to navigate really this balance between these two things, these means and these ends. And we can apply this kind of analysis not just to design, but as a way to examine like our motivation in all of our decisions, uh, our rational actions in life. You know, do we decide to take an action because it achieves an external benefit to us? Or do we do it because it's worthwhile in itself, like playing, right? Or is it some mixture of the two? You know, Many of you here are in high school today. You might ask yourself, you know, oh, am I going about my education as preparation for the next thing? That would be a means to an end. Or if you're in college, you know, am I getting an education because I, I want to get employed after I graduate? Also a means to an end. Or are you learning because you're interested? Because it's interesting. And because you're learning for its kind of sheer intrinsic value, right? And what if I told you that maybe we can do both? That it's okay to be strategic about doing things to better prepare you for the next, for some later outcome. You know, I, I think parents in the audience might be relieved to hear me say this. Uh, but all the while making sure you're engaged in what you're doing, what you're learning, to feed your genuine interests. You know, and, and at the end of the day, you know, isn't that what's going to make you truly happy? Right? You know, and, and, and don't you want to be happy? Don't you want to just not only live life, but to flourish as a human being? Right? And, and, and to parents, I would say, isn't this what you ultimately want for your kids? For them to be happy. So as a designer, I think I have to believe that it's not a question of versus, but rather of and. That maybe we can find this balance between the things we do for an external purpose and the things that are just worthwhile in themselves. So my book, Artful Design, you know, the central premise is that we've reached a point in our world where engineering needs to be about so much more than just functionality, but also ethics, social well-being, beauty, and also finding ways so that we might flourish as human beings, as a society and through aligning the world to be something closer to what we feel it ought to be. So to design artfully in the sense to seek kind of a truth, for the lack of a better word, of technology, but also of ourselves. What we make eventually comes back to make us. So technology historian Melvin Kranzberg's first law of technology states that technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Think about that. Technology has never been neutral, right? I mean, large social networks like Facebook or Twitter, well, they don't get to say, hey, here's a platform. What people do on it is not our responsibility. No, they don't get to do that. You know, and this is, this is design and engineering cannot, it cannot help but actually embody the rhetoric and the biases of the designers, the people that had a hand in making it, right? And this is why ethics matter. Um, for the choices we make in design are the, you know, have real implications for people that use the things we build and are, are the same as taking actions directly face to face, right? And if we believe this, then does that mean that we as engineers and designers should hold us accountable to the same moral ethical framework that we already hold ourselves accountable by in real life, face to face? That's the argument. Now, much of this is easier said than done, and it's very situational, you know, it depends. But if there's one rule we might apply to, you know, everything we do as an engineer, it might be this, the platinum rule. How many people here have heard the golden rule? I imagine some of you have, yes. What does the golden rule say? You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? What is the platinum rule? How many people heard the platinum rule? 
Okay, I see like two hands. The platinum rule states, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Uh, whereas the golden rule is kind of relating to others in your own, by your own experiences and preferences, the platinum rule is kind of like putting yourself into shoes of someone who may be very different from you, but asking you to always do your best to understand them and where they're coming from, even though you have a vast difference of experience. Right? Whereas the golden rule is really a statement of sympathy, the, the platinum rule is one of empathy. And what if we actually design in this fashion, right? Now, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant stated that, you know, act so that you treat humanity, whether in yourself or in another person, never as a means to an end, but always as an end in itself. Back to means and ends. You know, put more simply, this says always respect the humanity in others. Always. In all others. And if engineering design is no less worthy of our moral and ethical considerations, couldn't we apply this imperative to how we make decisions in shaping technology, which is never really an end in itself. Technology is here to, to help us, to serve our purposes, and where the people really are the end goals, right? And what if technology is something that's here to increase the well-being of people, who are the ends, and not just to solve practical problems, but you know, what if through technology we could somehow elevate ourselves as human beings, help us flourish? And what if this were the bottom line of doing business, of design, and of life in general? So that's most of my story, from mud bricks to ocarina. Uh, and I've shown you a few things I've designed. This is one more item of design. So everything I've talked about is kind of just the tip of the iceberg, and most of it's really easier said than done. So I wrote, and I should say designed, uh, kind of an unconventional book on all of this. Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime is a manifesto for the engineer with a soul. And it's quite unconventional. Uh, it's a book on design, but it was designed as a comic book. And the medium is one where I feel like, well, it's a book on design. The medium should kind of embody what I'm trying to say with a book, the medium, after all, is something of the message. And it begins in my office at Stanford, and off we go on an adventure in artful design, looking at instruments and toys and everyday objects in architecture, to toys made out of everyday computing technology, like mobile phone and ocarina, from the visual design of simple forms to complex visual systems, to programming and sound and computer music, to the art of interface design that membrane of interaction between technology and people. This is how we operate technology. From theremins to artificial intelligence with humans built into the loop, to game design, more than entertainment games as a means to express ourselves, but also to understand ourselves and our emotions. Social design. This chapter examines the, the things we really want from our social tools instead of what they might currently offer us. To the final chapter about truth in technology and putting our conscience and values into the things we make, knowing that these things will come back to make us. This is all to say the way we think about engineering needs to fundamentally evolve. The things we make ought to be not just functional, but beautiful, humanistic, socially meaningful. Above all, the shaping of technology should be truthful you know, to who we are and who we'd want to be. And if you believe there's something to this line of thinking, then tomorrow's engineer must be much more than a specialist, but kind of a technological artist, a moral ethical inventor, and a system designer who can really contextualize every piece of thing you put out into the world into how it's going to actually affect people in their everyday lives. So how might we educate such an individual? I would like to present kind of my formulation of the pi shapes do. Now, this exists in higher ed, and I've added my piece to it. Now, like the Greek letter pi, it has two legs, one of which here would represent being educated in a discipline. For example, for me, it was computer science. The other leg is the domain expertise. For me, it was music. But for someone else, it could be public health, and you're applying really a discipline to a particular domain, kind of really in the human world. This bar, however, is what, what I have as the aesthetic lens. This is the philosophical, artistic, 
and moral lens that gives you broader context in bridging these two things, right? And isn't this the kind of engineer we want to educate? And isn't this the kind of engineer we would want to strive to be? Perhaps, you know? And this is why, by the way, engineering, art, the humanities, and social sciences matter, and matter fundamentally to each other. For, you know, ultimately, these are not separate pursuits. And so, well, this is Artful Design, and that's a book for engineering with a soul. And these, these are my thoughts for all of you, the engineer with a soul. Thank you very much.